recording. The speaker I have the privilege to introduce is the founder of the Profitable Empires Framework for Women and CEO Founders. She is also in the 100 Women to Know in America, the International Hall of Fame, and also listed in Forbes BLK. She's also an investor and profitability strategist who can help you scale strategically while, get this, maintaining harmony. Now, what I love about her is her tell it like it is attitude. She's known for stepping on some toes and how she challenges entrepreneurs to redefine what success truly means. Please help me welcome today, Dr. Lynette Monte. Welcome, Dr. Lynette. How are you? I am amazing. How are you? I am doing wonderful this morning. I am super excited to sit down and peel back some layers on onions, have a wonderful conversation with you in our time this morning. But before we get started, I always like to share with our guests how I've come across or how I've met the people I've interviewed. So with you and I, this is my first time actually speaking to you in person. And so just to let everyone know, I received a message from Dr. Lynette a few weeks ago to come on as a guest on Intercultural Voices. And this is a platform that she hosts on LinkedIn, an audio platform every Wednesday. So I'm giving you a plug for you every Wednesday at 11 o'clock a.m. And I am going to tell you very insightful conversation immediately I felt the synergy and definitely listed her as one of the um, the persons that I have to get to know better and definitely one that I could glean and I could learn from. And so I thought what better way to you know do that is to have her on on social media Saturdays to share um, just our expertise. And she's talking about a wonderful topic, which is scaling, which a lot of us as entrepreneurs entrepreneurs and business owners, we want to be in the position to do that. But the question becomes, how do you do that? How do you do it in harmony? And, you know, how do you not burn out on your journey to building your business? So those are some of the things that we hopefully will be able to unpack today in our, in our, in our call. Absolutely. I'm ready. And I just want to say thank you, first of all, for the invitation. I am super excited. You already shared that I step on toes. So I'm telling you guys <laughs> now, I don't know what I may say, but what I do know is whatever I say, it's, it's coming from a place of truth. There is so much information online right now that simply isn't true. It's mm -hmm. making building a business, it's making scaling, it's making happiness unnecessarily difficult. And so I really am one who peels back the layers and lets you know what is real, not just what is behind the facades <laughs> that we see happening so much online. So yeah, let's roll. Let's get it started. Yeah, so I'm excited to have that conversation. But first, I'm going to ask you, um, start by sharing a little bit about your journey and how you came about creating the Profitable frame Empires Framework. Yeah, you know, I always think that's such a loaded question. And for me in particular, because I've been doing this for 36 years, I created this framework that long ago. And what I love about the framework, though, is it is a very strategic framework. Here's, here's toe stepping number one, <laughs> which is that a lot of people believe that you roll out of bed and you create a framework and voila, I have this framework and now I'm famous. The thing about a framework is that it needs to be tweaked. It needs to be tested. It needs to have very strong and good bones. And then to that framework, you add tactics. But what a lot of people are doing is they're creating tactics and tactics and tactics and tactics. And there's no substance 
to the tactics, right? And so I said all that to share that how I came by creating it is when I worked with big corporations like Marriott and Avis and Massage Envy and those names that we all know. And I saw the same challenges over and over and over and over again. They said they wanted to scale, but they really didn't. And mm -hmm. so I was like, okay, there's a problem here. You said you want to scale. You bring me into scale. I am amazing at scaling. But when I left certain companies, they weren't any better off than when I came. And at first I thought it was me, right? And so toe stepping number two, it's not you. It's not always you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the client who doesn't do the work. Sometimes it's the client who brings you in. They say they want to change, but they actually paid for something that they're not ready for. So it's not always you. I hear people say online that it's the coach's fault when a client doesn't get results. And that's not true. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it's not. So I started to tweak and to test the framework. And that's when I moved into also working with local businesses, working with consultants. I used to specifically and only work with speakers and authors. So I've tested this framework on all kinds of industries, all kinds of, of people. And over time now, it is a, it's a framework that I can say is proven because I've used it. I've changed it. I've tweaked it. Every time that something on social media changes, every time that something changes in marketing, every time that something changes in how we're supposed to show up, quote unquote, the framework. And if you have a framework, and I encourage you to have a framework, your framework doesn't need to change. It's the tactics that you add and you shift in that framework that actually would change. So that's how it all started. Same exact framework has not changed, just tweaked, reiterated, shifted. And like we, like we say with kids, right? When you have a child, they are who they are. If you have children and they're older now, you realize that, right? You think when they're younger, they're, oh, well, they're going to change. No, they're not. Like, they're not really going to change. They are who they are. You just raise them to be better. And so that's what happens with that with my framework. And that's what will happen with yours too. So if you don't have a framework yet, this is your seed to create one. Yeah. You know, I, I love that. And one of the things as I listen to you speak that's coming to mind for me is principles are few processes are many. And what you're talking about is so true. And especially being in the space of social media, I see it all the time. New platforms pop up every, it seems like every Monday morning. That's what I say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, platforms go away. There's so many different changes. And what I see is a lot of times, you know, entrepreneurs, business owners, they're scrambling to try to keep up with the platforms. But if you understand and you know that there are certain principles, and I'm glad that you said the frameworks are the bones, right? There are certain principles as a framework, you know, to social media. And once you adhere, you, are, you learn and then you adhere to these principles principles, then it really doesn't matter what platform comes up because the principles are the same, you know, and you find yourself less and less ch chasing trends, you know, and falling into fads. And every time there's a disruption, it seems like your business is toppling because you're trying to change that. So I love that you started us off with, with that. But I'm going to back it up a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to share, Dr. Lynette, what's your definition of scaling? So I'm just going to be honest and let everyone know this is a word that I have um, heard throughout, you know, my journey as a business owner. And I would like to get, you know, your definition of what do you, you know, look at as scaling? 
Yeah, you would start with a question that's going to get me in trouble already. Of course. <laughs> this, is a safe, this is a safe space for you to get in trouble all day long. So you could come here and start mess. Uh, where's Allegra? Where's Allegra? She has my back. She knows I'm always saying something. Where is she? She's <laughs> so, right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the thing about scaling. Scaling has turned into this big buzzword that every time I turn around, someone has a different definition for. Once again, they have made it so complicated and it's really not. And here's why I'm so passionate about the answer I'm getting ready to give. It's because people keep saying that you don't scale until you're at a million dollars. That's ridiculous. You guys know ridiculous is my word, right? That's nonsense. You do not need to wait until you are at a million dollars to scale. Mm. Because if you look up the definition of scale, this isn't my definition. All the definitions you're hearing people give are the ones that they're making up. If you look okay. in the dictionary, the dictionary tells you that scaling really is just about improving, making something better, growing whatever that thing is without adding more work or more, not necessarily more people or more expenses to the growth, period. Mm -hmm. You are growing without adding more work or more expenses to the growth. And so when you think of it that way, scaling, I, 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 you know that, have you, have you guys heard the saying that says always be marketing? Well, I'm, I'm taking that saying hostage. And my new saying is always be scaling. Whether you are making $1,000 a month or you're making $100,000 a month, there is a next level for you to get to your scaling. <laughs> so it's not about being at a million dollars and then now you're going to scale. Every single business owner at every single income or revenue level needs to scale. The difference is what? What are you scaling? Where is your focus when you scale? And so, for example, if you are at $100,000, what you're focusing on in scaling is going to be totally different than someone who is at $100 million. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first key. It is the most important part about scaling. It's simple. It's not complicated. It doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't have to be expensive. All of those are not true. They're telling you that because they want to sell you something. So mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you the truth. Number one, I have a I have what's called a profit profile. It's free. It's a profit profile analysis. You can go to my LinkedIn. There's a link there. Take the profit profile analysis. It will tell you where you are in your business. Mm -hmm. And it will then tell you what your focus needs to be at this point. Just do that. And then guess what? After that, take the information, go to chat GPT and say, this is where I am in my business. This is the focus that is healthy for me at this stage of my business. Tell me what I need to do next. What would I scale next, right? You really do not need Oh boy, I said this the other day and I know I'm some, some COOs and some OBMs was mad with me, but you really don't need to hire me or someone else to do your SOPs, to, to create your processes and systems. Mm -hmm. You can let chat do that, I promise you. Mm -hmm. Chat will do an amazing job at it. But what you do need to know is where are you in the business and what do you need to be focusing on? So when you hear scaling, hear me in the back of your head say, that's nonsense. That's what you're gonna hear, nonsense, that's nonsense. <laughs> that's what you're gonna hear, okay? Because you have some people who say, I will teach you scaling, but they only do one thing. They only do email. 
Well, guess what? That's fine. Your email does need to scale, but I need you to understand that if you only scale your email, the rest of your business is crumbling. Mm -hmm. So when you think about scaling in its truest sense, it is about your whole business. It's a holistic move. Mm -hmm. It's not just a one part of your business move. You may take each move step by step, but you can't take one step and not address the other steps and believe that your business is scaling. So that's it in a nutshell. Definition in the dictionary and my soapbox. <laughs> no, I, I love that. And, and I love the piece that you just added to the end, right? Um, uh, and so I too have been confused. I've heard a lot of things in the way of the word scaling, you know, for businesses. And here's the thing, what you just said was so important. So as you take a look at the different areas of your business, knowing when you increase you know, produ productivity or you focus on one area, it's going to cause, if you're not careful, gaps in other areas. And so therefore you have to be willing to be prepared to fill those gaps and bring those other parts of your business, you know, together. So in other words, you scale your email list, you got a lot of people on your list, but then you don't know what to do with the people on the list because, you haven't developed <laughs> communication, you haven't developed offers, you haven't developed all of those things. So I love, I love, love, love that you just broke it down really easy and really simple for us today. So I, I'm gonna ask you, so what are some of the key elements when you talk about scaling your business or design, designing a scalable business? Yeah. There's a lot of elements to it. Again, they're simple. Let me just say this, the, the, the framework. Let me tell you what the levels or the layers of the framework are. I'm not going to go into each one. I'm just going to tell you what they are and then um, really answer your question, Taria. Mm -hmm. And so there's seven layers to the framework. What I love about the layers is, again, it's evergreen. So layer number one is, excuse me, Layer number one is power. Mm -hmm. Layer number two is position. Number three is people. Number four is processes. We follow. I just want to make sure everybody's with me. Yep. Number five is pioneer. Number six is partner and number seven is profit now there's a lot that goes into each of those layers but they're very simple layers there's they're words that you recognize right you you can glean just from the words what probably goes into each of those layers and so when you talk about scaling, I really, really lean on those four, th those seven things because it keeps people focused as opposed to running over here, chasing bright, shiny objects, you know, trying to push easy buttons, knowing that there are these seven areas of your business to focus on scaling, then you don't get off track. But what I really want to talk about in terms of your question is, are you ready to scale? Mm. And when I say ready, I believe if I've already said always be scaling, your business is ready to scale usually before you are. Mm. One of the things that I see happen more often than not is it's really the person who's not ready to scale. Now, let me say this, even though it says the framework is for women, it is it is not it, it's gender neutral. Scaling is gender neutral. The framework is gender neutral. I have clients who are men. I love men. Right. So it's not a woman thing. But this example that I'm going to give, it is. One of the reasons that I love to work with women so much is because we are natural nurturers. And we do this with our children, we do this with our loved ones, and we do this with our business. We, not, we nurture and we coddle 
our business for too long. We don't let it go. We don't bring people in to help because we think we can do it better. We are the ones who are not ready to scale. So when you ask about what is a key component to scaling, that really is it. First and mm -hmm. foremost, you have to be ready to number one, accept the fact that no one is going to do it the way that you do it, but there are some people who will do it better. There are some people who will do it faster and they don't need to do it 100% the way that you will. If they can do it 75% as well as you or the way that you desire for it to be done, that is good enough for government work. Let them do it so that you can focus on your genius. You can focus on why you're here and what you are bringing to the world. That's where the, over, the overwhelm and the burnout is coming from. It's us still trying to juggle all the balls. So here's one of my favorite sayings. Again, I, I want you to hear this. Every time that you get ready to do something in your business that you oughtn't be doing, every time that you hesitate to outsource when you know you ought to, every time that you have something on your plate that you look at and you dread, because that's the first step, in my opinion, in scaling, is what is on your plate that you dread doing? That's the first thing to get off. Don't worry about what someone else is telling you to scale first. The first thing to scale is what is giving you anxiety, what is draining your energy. That's the first thing to scale. And guess what? When I got ready to scale, the first thing that I did was I hired a housekeeper. <laughs> so hear me when I say this, that scaling isn't just about what you do in your business. Scaling is also what you do for your business. Scaling is also what you do for you. And I did not want to clean that house. I did not have time to keep cleaning the house. I had things to do. I wanted to use my brilliance. I didn't want to clean the house. And so I, I want to say this. Here's the phrase going back to what I want you to hear ringing your head. I'm not going to be with you, but I want you to hear these things in your head. <laughs> Are you ready? This is a writer downer, actually. This one <laughs> is. Are you growing your business to death? Ooh, I like that. Are you growing your business to death? I like that one. I like that. And the reason that it's important is because when people call me in to help them with scaling, they usually wait until everything is on fire. Their hair is on fire. All the different parts of the business is on fire. Their bank account is on fire. Like it's just a hot mess. And that's when they want to call in help. And so what happens, though, in that situation is I want you to imagine this. You may feel this way. And, I, and if you don't feel this yet, I don't want you to get here. You are building this amazing business. It's successful. It's making money. You have clients, you have customers, but you are the one juggling all the balls, right? Imagine you're juggling. You've got eight balls that are up in the air. You're juggling these balls. Well, you know that you need to bring someone in to help you, but you can't let go of any of the balls in order to go through the hiring process. You can't let go of any of the balls in order to onboard and train the person that you know you need to come in to help you because you have gotten to a point where the business is highly successful. You can't stop showing up on social media. You can't stop serving the client. You can't stop any of the balls that you're currently juggling or your revenue is going to plummet. Here's what are you growing your business to death looks like. That's the beginning of what it looks like. And then you're backed up in this corner now, juggling these balls. In order for you to get out of that corner, you are likely going to have to shut down your business momentarily so that someone can come in and take some of those balls. That's where I don't want you to get. 
because that's when you know you have grown your business to death. You can't come out of that corner. You can't stop juggling the balls, which means that you cannot increase your revenue because you're going to be stuck there juggling the balls and you can't let any of the balls drop. So I want you to think about that when you start thinking about growth, expansion, hiring. And here's another one that people won't tell you. Sometimes that means that you are going to not just let go of things that you don't need to do in your business anymore. Sometimes it means that you are going to stop selling something that is making you money. That is a hard pill to swallow when you realize that in order to grow and expand, you may very well have to stop offering something that is a money maker for you. I agree. I, I see Allegra's head going. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. I had to give up, I had to give up a whole cultural group just because they wouldn't people wouldn't want to pay us they wanted us to do for free and i went mm, no more no more i had to step back i had to my students were like no more <laughs> i agree <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna say this dr lynette um toes stepped on right and <laughs> oh my gosh and the toes the toes being stepped on our minds this morning and so it's that the, the, you, you know, I graciously accept the toe stepping. So it's is what you're saying is absolutely correct. Being able to take a look and honestly know that there are things that you should not be doing in your business. And that is the challenge that I have is the challenging releasing, okay? Now, it's easy to get the stuff that you don't like to do off your plate. Okay. But I'm going to tell you one of my challenges is that there are things that I love to do. It still don't need to be on my plate. <laughs> so to get those things off of my plate. So this is going to back in to the question that you know, I myself ask, and I know a lot of other business owners ask it, like when it comes to hiring and you take a look at your revenue, you take a look at what you're making in your business and you start to think about people, bringing people in. One of the first things that comes to mind is I can't afford it. When I take a look at the business, it's it's barely doing what I want it to do or I'm just, uh, you know, just a little bit above water. What would that look like or how can I possibly bring people in? So can you speak to that? Can you answer that? Because I know it's a lot of questions and I get those questions, you know, from my clients as well. Yeah. There's and a I lot. ask the question myself too. So yeah. Ooh, there's a lot in that one. Okay. <laughs> So let's go. So first of all, absolutely and 100%, we, we all wind up sort of, a, I like to call it the messy middle. And mm -hmm. the messy middle is a phrase that's used a lot, especially in corporate, but it's very appropriate for businesses of all levels, because at some point you're stuck between where you are and where you want to go. It right? doesn't matter what your revenue level is or whether you're a big business or a small business. We all come to that bypass moment of there's too much going on for me to handle, but there's not enough coming in for me to really bring on help. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I love this as an example of that messy middle and how we get from one side of the bridge to the other side of the bridge. Number one, I really want you to keep in mind that there, there, there still is a such thing as internships. Mm. And if people have not considered someone doing an internship with them, you, you really want to do that. There are some internship opportunities where you are not paying the person at all. Those are far and few between now because it is uh, more expected that interns are getting paid. However, an intern is not getting paid anywhere near 
what someone is getting paid that is coming onto your team. So colleges and universities are a great place to look because a lot of degrees require that they do an internship or an externship before they can get that particular degree. And in those scenarios, you cannot be paid. When I went to law school, we had to do an externship at a law firm in order to graduate a whole, a whole year. <laughs> and we were not allowed to be paid. Mm -hmm. So this law firm had me, my work, my genius, my whatever they wanted me to do for a whole year and they didn't have to pay me. And so a lot of colleges and universities, that is the way it's structured when it comes to an internship that they have to do in order for that degree. So look there. The second thing is, believe it or not, there are a lot of people who would be willing to work with you for free because they want to be like, they want you to be their mentor. They want to learn what it is that you know. I, I'll give an example and I really don't want to, but it's a good example. Um, I, I'm not a big SEO person, like SEO just isn't my thing. But if I really wanted to understand SEO better, it's one of those topics that to me is not great learning on YouTube. It's just something about SEO that I feel you need a human <laughs> to really, Greg is like, mm -mm. <laughs> that you need a human, right? You need to shadow somebody to really understand SEO. I would look for someone who's amazing in SEO and I would ask them, well, can I work for you for free? So I can learn SEO. There are lots of people who will do that. Yeah. Third thing, and this may be controversial and choose, you know, pick a side, no, no problem. But the, the truth is that hiring overseas is more cost effective than hiring people who are in the United States. Now, you may feel some kind of way about that, and I absolutely respect how you feel. Choose what works for you. But here's what I do want you to understand. We are all human. We all have children to feed. We all have families to take care of, and we all need to get paid. The thing about overseas, some people say, well, that you know, you're taking advantage of them because you're paying them $2 an hour. You have to understand the value of a dollar overseas. It has nothing to do with us taking advantage of them. A dollar or two dollars an hour or three dollars an hour to them, like they think they're rich if they're making three and four dollars an hour. It's just the truth, right? The, the dollar is different. What they have to pay for there is different. And so honestly, if you're at a point in the business where you are tight on money, you may very well want to consider hiring someone from overseas. The Philippines is one of my favorites simply because they English is their first language. So they are very um, proficient in using and writing English and lots of other reasons. Um, another option is outsourcing. A lot of people feel like I need to hire someone. I need to bring someone on full time. I need to, and you don't need to at all. You can go to someplace like Fiverr and hire someone for five or $10. Go to Odesk and put in, this is the specific task that I need done. I don't need someone for 20 hours a week. I don't need someone for 40 hours a week, right? And there's a difference between someone that's a contractor that you're bringing in for a specific thing and someone who works for you. A lot of us have come from a place of being an employee. So we know that there's the whole FICA expense that goes into having an employee. So we're not just talking about how much we have to pay them. We also have the FICA that we have to match. We have health benefits if we really care about our people. So that's when it gets to be really expensive. So when you're starting, don't think about that yet. Think about, I need this task done, this one task right here. Let me go find someone who can do this task right here. 
This is what I can pay them. They will do the task and they will go about their way. And one tip about Fiverr, I have a whole team in Fiverr. You can make a folder in Fiverr. Once I find someone that I like a lot who does an amazing job, I add them to my team. I've been working with someone on Fiverr now since Fiverr started. And I just send a message and I'm like, this is what I need you to do on this website. Okay, no problem. Like they know all of my brands. They know all of my websites. They have a login to all of my websites. They are just like an intricate part of my team. So when you think about hiring, team can look different to different people at different times in your business. So pick something that works for you. Don't get overwhelmed with it being a big project. It can be one little teeny step that you don't have to do or one little teeny part of a project that you're getting stuck on and not moving forward. Yeah, I love these, Dr. Lynette, because it's outside of the box thinking. Right. And so a lot of times, you know, people get stuck in the how can I do this? And until they understand that there are um, very viable ways to get things done. And one of the things that stood out for me, as you talked about, was mentorship. And so we I have a few people on here who um, know me from back in the day when I mentored with my mentors, um, Shay and Trevor. Right. And that's where I started. And the conversation was kind of simple, you know, about over 10 years ago, I had uh, visions of sugar plums dancing in my head to become an entre entrepreneur. And um, <laughs> I think it was Trevor who said it. Um, you, you, you really need to go learn some things. Right. And so what I'm going to do is give you the opportunity, you know, to come up under mentorship and really learn. And it was there. I really got clear on one of the questions I'm getting ready to ask, how to uncover my unique brilliance and the things that I bring to the table. So you see, when I started, I was all over the place. And I thought because I knew how to do things, those were the things that I was supposed to be doing, okay? So I learned a lot and then I had to learn how to streamline it, okay? And so what I wanna ask you next is, can you speak a little bit to how entrepreneurs can identify and leverage their unique strengths to maximize profitability? Oh, I love that. Okay, let's try to make this a quick answer. As you guys see, I'm not a quick answer kind of person. I go deep. You ask me a question, I'm going in. <laughs> so, so um, okay, so here's the truth. And, and, and it's so simple. When you think about the thing, that, you know, some people say that lights you up. Like, what is that thing that when you think about it, you just jump out of the bed. Like you jump out of that bed like, yes, you know, I get to X, Y, Z. What is that? Because you you just alluded to it. You said, we know how to do a lot of things. We, we know how to do a lot of things well, but that doesn't mean that all of those things light us up. And I want to say that there is also a distinction between your brilliance and your purpose. Mm. Doesn't mean that they can't be the same thing, but sometimes they're not the same thing. And I find that's where we get stuck. That's where we get tripped up because we think that our purpose and our brilliance have to be the same. And they don't have to be the same. I had a coach who taught me the difference between vocation and avocation. Mm. And, and, and that, that it really set me free because I kept trying to figure out, well, what is my purpose? Because I have lots of brilliances and I, I was stuck. I was, I was stuck. And she said, listen, that's because you think they have to be the same. And they don't have to be the same. What you do to make money, what you do as a business, what you bring to the table that generates revenue 
doesn't have to be the same as what your purpose is. So let me give you an example. Yeah. I have been a fractional COO and profitability strategist for 36 years. It is absolutely my genius, hands down. I can do it in my sleep. I love doing it. My brain thinks like a mind map. Awesome. However, it's not my purpose. I love it. Do it all day. Would do it for free. Because that's the other thing people say. What would you do for free? Well, I would do that for free because I love it. But it's not my purpose. My purpose is intercultural voices. My purpose is helping people to live a life that they love. My saying is live the legacy you want to leave. Don't wait until you're dead because then it's going to be too late. Live today the legacy you want to, to leave, right? It's cultural equity. That is my purpose. It's giving voice to people or giving people a platform and a place to share their voice where they wouldn't necessarily have that opportunity because of their skin color, right? That's my purpose. My purpose is to say the things <laughs> that other people wouldn't say. <laughs> so those are two different places in your life. And then I want to add this, when you're thinking about that brilliance, it changes. That's the other thing that tripped me up is I thought that you had a purpose in life and it would always be that purpose. And then it, 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 I was stuck. I was like, but wait, but wait, that's my purpose is over there. Like I'm over here and my purpose is over there. What happened? And I kept trying to get back on the same street with my purpose until that same coach explained to me that your purpose changes as you grow, as you move through life and have experiences, as the world around you changes, so does your purpose. And once I realized that you can have a, a new purpose, I was like, yes, this is the coolest thing ever. I get to do something else great, right? And so when you're thinking about your brilliance and identifying what that is, you know what it is. I believe that we all know what it is. I think that we get it mixed up with purpose or we get it or we get attached to it. Remember I talked earlier about we don't want to let stuff go. We get attached to a particular brilliance that we've had for 20 years and are not comfortable with moving on to a new brilliance, right? And so that that's it in a nutshell for me. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Oh my gosh, so many things. Like I have a whole page full of notes going on here. And so um, I, I want to give you some time. I have like so many more questions. I see a part two. But anyway, I, <laughs> I want to give you some time to share your intercultural voices initiative. And so exactly what you just spoke a little bit about it. So can you share with everyone um, what's the initiative and the impact of intercultural voices? Yeah, you know, that that's that's my baby. That's my legacy. I believe that legacy is not what you leave. Legacy is what you are doing right now every single day mm -hmm. because that's what your family is watching. That's what your children, that's what people around you see. It, it, once you're gone, what you leave them may not even be what matters to them at all. And so intercultural voices is a combination of things for me. Number one, I realized about five years ago when one of my children got very, very, very sick and all the money I had, I spent all these years making lots of money and every dime I had couldn't heal her, couldn't fix it. And I thought, wait a minute, I've, I've worked all this time and I have all this money and I can't heal my child. And I realized the difference between legacy and how we make an impact. So number one part is, instead of me building a business to leave to my children that they very well may not want, I asked each of my children, what is it that matters to them? 
-hmm. My son said, well, what matters to me is equity, is cultural equity, is that people of color, not just black people, but people of color understand that as a collective, we are not the minority. If we can understand that when we come together and we make one voice, that we have all the power. If we can understand that our businesses don't have to struggle, people just need to know who you are. They need to know what you have to offer. You need the skills in order to build a business. You need to partner and collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. So we realized my son is 33 and he started his first business when he was 10 years old. So he's talking from a lot of wisdom, not just because, you know, he woke up one day and decided that this was a good idea. What we realized, Taria, is that so many people of color are not successful or are less than successful because they don't have number one access. Mm -hmm. So we have three pillars at Intercultural Voices. One is access. Do you have access to being on platforms or are you being shunned because of your color? Are you being overlooked because of your color? Are you not getting awards and all the kinds of things that are so easy? Or are you not on, you know, the NBC news channel? What, whatever that is, what is the access? It could be access to funding. We're all challenged because of our skin color. And that is just the reality of it. The second pillar is leadership. We were not taught how to be leaders. It's a thing now, but, but I'm Gen X. We weren't taught how to be leaders. We don't know how that is just naturally. Well, actually, we do know how it is naturally. They fooled us and tried to convince us that we don't know how to be leaders. And so leadership is a skill. It's a muscle that can be developed. So we have classes and programs that people can take so that particularly rising leaders will know what leadership looks like as opposed to what they've been told it looks like or what has been demonstrated to them as being leadership. And then the third one, which is huge for us, is well-being. It's well-being because we believe that you can be happy, healthy, and wealthy. You don't have to choose. You don't have to choose business success over happiness. And so for us, Intercultural Voices is all about primarily giving people of color the platform to be seen and heard, access to training that can elevate their self-mastery without shade, if you will, the young people say, right? And then really helping us to understand the importance of mindset, the importance of what you're putting in your body, the importance of how you are developing your spirit. And so we take that three-prong approach. The part you are familiar with most is, of course, our weekly yeah. audio live, where there's no, there's no cost. If you have an, an expertise, if you have a conversation you want to share, inbox me. Let's talk about it. Let's get you on an audio live. Let's have that conversation. And intentionally, it's an audio live, not video, because I don't want people to judge whether they're going to come or not because they've seen the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. I intentionally chose to do this as an audio to try to decrease that shade and increase people attending for the knowledge and the growth and the information and for your brilliance. So that's sort of it in a nutshell, big nutshell, yeah. but it's a nutshell. <laughs> no, I love it. And I'm glad that you shared that piece about intercultural voices being an audio. And so one of the things 
for those of who on here who have had the opportunity to work with me, they know I'm big on video. And so I was just like, why isn't this a video? And I asked you the question and you answered it and it made absolute sense why you're doing that and you're having it that way. So thank you for that. And so I, I wanna, I'm being mindful of the time, but I want to go ahead and, um, open it up for questions, ask the expert questions. So what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and stop the recording and then I'm gonna start the recording again.